Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today is going to be a continuation of the plant review series, and this is one that's been requested by a lot of people where a lot of people were like, can we get some more allocations? And yes, I've got a couple of allocations that I'm going to line up into the series, but we'll start off with, interestingly enough, the one that has given me the most amount of trouble. And without further ado, that is the Alocasia beginder, I think it's pronounced, but uh, commonly called the Alocasia dragon scale, which you might be able to see why from the video. Now, I will also be talking about the silver alocasia dragon scale, which I've got right here. And you might be able to see it is slightly different than the green one that we were looking at here. Obviously, it's got the silveriness on the leaves. It's not just fully green. This one I have had for about a year or two less than what I've had the green one for, but the title of the video, just to make it easy, will be based on the time frame of the green one. If I'm not mistaken, it's either three or four years, but I will put that up on the title. Now, for anybody that's coming back, welcome back. You know, as always, that I'll have the chapters down below. I am also trying something new for this video where I've got the camera a bit closer to me. I can hopefully be able to, with some of these smaller plants, be able to get closer to the camera to show you. If it's a bit too much, because I'm aware that some people watch this on big screen TVs, my head might be a bit too huge for your TV. So let me know if you'd prefer the further distance, but I thought I'd try it for this one. And if you're new and you're joining, welcome to the insanity that is this series. As always, I usually do try to link it, but I'll link the plant review series at the top there. There is now a playlist of quite a few videos. So if you like this and you want to check some of the other ones, that will be there for you to check. But Ground rules that I will always set for the newbies joining for the first time, there is no way to make these reviews unbiased. They will be my biased opinion with my plant, in my condition, with the care that I give it. So just to give you some context there, I'm growing my plants in a conservatory in the UK. These two specific plants today have also been in other properties with other conditions, but I will touch on that throughout the video. And yeah, as always, I encourage people, if you've got this plant and you want to share your experiences with everybody down below in the comments, that is mainly the reason why I'm doing this, is I want a repository, even if it is just these videos online, where people can go and check how people's experiences have been growing this plant. Now, without further ado, let's go into the first topic. So the background on this plant is kind of an interesting story. So I'll kind of tilt it around and show you again. I might see about getting some extra clips and interspersing it throughout the video, but because I'm a bit closer for this one, I should be able to just show you. This was a much, much bigger plant. Let's start with that when I first bought it. And I will put a picture here to show you what it was like when I first purchased it. So you might be able to see it is considerably larger than what it is now. And that links into the story of the background. But first things first, the way that I had this come into my collection is I was looking for it for a long time. There wasn't that many sellers in the UK that were selling this. Interestingly enough, I found it from a local plant seller. And I'd kind of reached out and they didn't have any in stock. and I was on holiday and they ha they messaged me, bless, uh, this is Carl from Turner Tropical. And uh, I think this is before his company got as big as it is now. I think it was still a sizable business back then, but he was very kind of good at reaching out to people. I think Carl still does that. He's such a lovely, lovely individual. And as I said, local as in I can get into my car, drive for five, 10 minutes, and I can be in his plant nursery, which I have visited once. It is amazing. But yeah, he kind of reached out to me and said, look, I'm getting some in from the Netherlands. Would you like one? I'm just like, yes. 
And this was this was an interesting price of this one. I'll talk about it a bit more in availability. But back then, this is one of the more rare plants that I've added to my collection, and it was a big price. <laughs> Little did I know <laughs> this was actually quite affordable even back then. I do see these coming up a bit more frequently and at good prices. But again, we'll talk about that in availability. And picked it up from him. It was in a plastic pot. It was in pure coca coa, if I'm not mistaken, at that point. And it was relatively sizable. I got into my car when I came back. And I, back then, I'd lived in London for a long time, and you don't generally tend to drive. And pretty much, again, uh, warning of the side story here. If you want to skip ahead, please do. But I didn't drive that often. I got my license and as many people went straight into university, had no reason to drive in London, didn't really do an awful lot of driving, moved outside of London in the last seven years, I think. And this is kind of close to when I'd first moved. I had no reason to drive, but I still got in my car. Worried is the word that I'm allowed to say on YouTube, but for the Brits, they probably know the word I'm thinking of and decided to go and drive and pick this plant up and so, so worth it. I was driving like a little old lady on the way back so I don't end up snapping this plant. That was the beginning of a journey for me with this plant. I don't think a lot of people have the same issues that I have with this plant and you might be able to see the issue down there. We'll kind of have a look at what that is at the back of the leaves. And I have struggled with this plant a lot. It's kind of moved into different conditions. And as you can imagine now, it's a lot smaller than when I first got it. It got to the stage where I had the smallest last corm remaining from this plant. And it has since come back from the dead. But yeah, I think that's enough about background and random driving tangent there as well. Let's move into the next topic. So a speed of growth on both of these, both the silver and the green, and I can kind of touch base a bit more on both. Interestingly, and I don't know whether or not it's because my green struggled as much as it did, but I actually found that the silver dragon scale grows faster, or it has done in my conditions. And I will say now that both of these plants are currently in pond in self-watering, Bit of a spoiler with that one. These are probably the last couple of allocations that I would attempt to put into pond. I think I've learned my lesson at this point. I cannot get allocations to be happy in pond. They will always throw a bit of a hissy fit. I think actually maybe the last one that I'm trying is my Aslanii, and let me show you that. And this is the Alocasia Aslanii, and I don't know whether or not it's gonna come across on the camera. Oh yeah, there you go. You can maybe see some of the pink purpley veining that's happening on that leaf. But this is also in pond, but I'm getting better now at how I deal with transferring allocations into pond. And for me, it generally means get it out of the soil that it is, with the roots that it has, get rid of any of the rot and put it into water to start developing some water roots and then move it into pond. There is a very finite line and I will say, based on some other allocations with similar thick leaf structure as the dragon scale is, I have found that if you leave it in water for a bit too long, you can start rotting out the corm. So just moving it out a bit sooner would be good. As soon as you start seeing those water roots, move it into pond if you really want to do it. I know a lot of people have great success and their allocations, all of their allocations grow exceptionally well in Lekka. I gave up on Lekka a while ago. I might give it another try to try with some of my less fussy allocations and see how it goes. But to be fair, and people that have been here for a very long time probably already know that I have got some large alocasia specimens. So for instance, my uh, alocasia miscalitiana, sometimes called Friedet, Friedet. I always get, I always add a T at the end of it. So Friedet, and it's usually kind of misnamed as Friedek because Frydeck apparently is the variegated form of it. It's just Miscalitiana for the green form. I've got the green form, it's huge. I've got an Alocasia Gagiana variegata behind. I've generally been quite good with Alocasias. If you want, I've done a few Alocasia 
care videos in the past. If you want a bit of an update on those ones, please do let me know in the comments down below and I can put it together. But yes, this one grows, again, I'll benchmark it against the Pothos and say, mm, if a Pothos will grow two or three leaves in the busy period, busy period, summer period. Oh, I've only had the one coffee today, can you tell? This one might bring out one leaf a month. So if the Pothos will bring out two or three leaves in a month in the summer, this one will bring out one leaf, maybe two in the summer. This one's a bit faster, so probably will, if this one's bringing up one leaf, this one will bring out two. So that's something to bear in mind. Again, just my experience. If anybody's got both and they want to comment, I have heard from a few people that they have the same experience with their silver one. Interestingly, it grows faster than the green one. So that is something to be said there. But yeah, let's move on to the next topic. So propagation with this one, and as I said in the background section, I have bought this plant back from Corms all the time. Does it propagate relatively easily? Yes. I'm not going to go into an alocasia propagation method with you in this video, but I have mentioned it in a couple of other videos. Emma from Good Growing, and I will link her channel down below. A lot of people that subscribe to me subscribe to her, so you probably already know Emma. For the people that don't, please do discover Emma at Good Growing in the link down in the description below. She's an awesome person. But she does a shallow puddle method, which is um, in a tray, put some water, a very shallow puddle, drop the corm in, make sure that it's kind of got humidity around it. So kind of put either cling film over it, or if it's a uh, why am I blocking? Um, Tupperware container with a clear lid, put that on top, just open it up every so often to kind of like let new air in and it works like a charm. Uh, I wasn't doing it with this one, this before I discovered Emma's method, but um, yeah, it did relatively well in soil propagation. It did relatively well in pond propagation for this specific alocasia. So wasn't too, too bad. It does take a beat and I find this with all alocasias, not just this one. They are not the fastest thing to propagate specifically from corn. It takes a while for the roots to get going. It takes a while for the leaves to get going. And even when the first few leaves start coming in, it's going to be a while before you start getting a really, really bushy plant. That has been my experience. If you are exceptionally fast at all allocation propagation, do drop it down below. I'd be very curious to see what people are doing if they're getting very fast propagations in their alocasia, and I mean fast in total. So rooting, leaves, an established plant. If you can get that in the span of a year from nothing, from a corm, to kind of a relatively full plant, do let us know what you do. I'd be really, really curious, and I bet I can see the comments now. We do it in Lekka. So yes, I will be trying that at some point in the future. But generally speaking, not difficult for propagation for me, at least. That's what I found just not the fastest propagation. So yeah, it's an okay one to get going. As with most alocasias, it will mainly be through quorms. One thing that I didn't mention and I still need to try, and I'm looking at some of my taller alocasias, less so the dual alocasias, more the kind of traditional alocasias, the, the kind of elephant ear ones. Those ones, if I'm not mistaken, you can kind of decapitate it, take a small section of the kind of growing corm, which is now obviously quite high above the soil line, and let that callus over and put it on top of soil. Again, kind of make sure that it's got the humidity that it needs, and it should root out and start growing. I haven't tried it, but I'm pretty sure that's what my mother has done for years with collocations. And collocations and alocasias grow very, very similarly. Their morphology and their physiology is very, very similar. So it'd be worth a try. I might do that, as I said, with one of my kind of taller alocasias that are not dual alocasias. Because for people that are not aware, some of these smaller alocasias, I'm thinking about the black velvet alocasia, all of these ones are called dual alocasias. Now coming into availability for both of these plants, I will say, and I did mention in the beginning, it was particularly difficult to get the green one, let alone the silver one, back when I first got the green one. 
But since then, I have seen them more or less everywhere, both the green version and the silver version. Granted, I still think the silver version, well, it depends. I think I see the silver version more in Europe and the green one more in the UK in terms of it. They're both available, but more abundant in Europe, I think, and more abundant in the UK, I think. If you had different experiences, again, let me know down below. I'm very curious to see. Maybe that's just, I'm imagining things. But they've become a lot more available now. And I mentioned in the very beginning in the background that I thought this was a very expensive plant when I bought it. <laughs> no. Uh, this was mid double digits. And it probably was for this plant. It was probably the most pricey that this plant has ever been. Granted, it was a large plant. I think there was a period where people were still looking for it and people started selling baby or smaller plants, probably close to the price that I paid for a relatively full plant. So I would have been a bit raw if I got it now, especially considering that these can be found relatively easily now as baby plants for not an awful lot of money. I would say high single digits to very, very low double digits, basically. At least that's what I'm finding. So not a particularly difficult one to find. And it does grow relatively well, it makes sense. At least here in Europe, I think most of these are coming from the Netherlands. The growers there are growing these all the time. Alocasias are one of those things that have always been in kind of houses as house plants. It tends to be interesting because I think it's quite a regional thing. Alocasias are very, very big. Alocasias and colocasias are very, very big back home in Greece and Cyprus, and they have been for years. They're the most quintessential houseplant after the pothos, probably even more than the Monstera deliciosa. So that's quite an interesting one that I kind of experienced culturally. The plants that have been houseplants or um, the kind of genuses of houseplants that have been around for a very long time, but have also been exceptionally popular can vary from country to country. So I find that quite interesting. But yeah, these are a lot more available these days. I think most people would have probably tried to have either one in their collection. I don't know, I think I've started seeing that sometimes you can get variegated versions of this plant as well, of the green one at least. I think maybe the silver one as well, maybe, or maybe I'm imagining that. Um, there's a lot of like uh, rare plant catfishes on Instagram there probably aren't real plants, so I don't know if that was a catfish that I think, but I think I've seen both of these variegated. I am very hesitant with variegated alocasias because they can be quite unstable and they can revert quite easily as well. And at least that's what I hear. I have never tried this. So I'm not talking from experience. I am literally spouting hearsay at this point. But I've heard this from enough people to kind of believe it at this point. And again, kind of followers on Instagram and subscribers on here have kind of made similar questions that they're a bit worried sometimes when they're starting to get green leaves. The problem with a lot of alocasias is if you've not got multiple corms in the same pot and not every single one of them has got variegation and one of them starts getting green leaf after green leaf after green leaf because of the way that they grow out of that singular corm, it can revert back to green very quickly. And this, it's unlike a philodendron or a mustera where you can cut it and it will kind of branch out from where it last had variegation. I don't think it necessarily works for these. It could, with the propagation methods that I was mentioning before, if you're gonna be cutting it at that kind of stem level and trying to find a node and putting it into soil. But yeah, I mean, relatively available these days, I would imagine. Let's talk pests for these plants. And I am gonna go with the obvious one because if I don't, I would be remiss. It's an alocasia. <laughs> Spider mites are, uh, love all types of alocasias. I will say out of a lot of my other alocasias, these alocasias, um, and I was gonna say even the dark velvet, but no, the dark velvet has, the black velvet has got the occasional spider mite. These are the most resistant I found. So the dragon scale tends to be the most resistant to dragon scale in my experience. However, <laughs> uh, the people that have been here for a while will know and they also know what I'm looking at. There isn't any mealybugs on this and I'm actually really surprised because there's been occasions 
where I found mealybugs on this. I will say, generally speaking, though, for thinking about it now a bit more clearly, in relation to a lot of my other allocations, this doesn't tend to have an awful lot of pest pressures. It does have, for me, the problem that you're seeing there with the darkness on the leaf and the yellowing tips there, but I will talk about that in the care section, which let's move on to that. So that leads me very nicely into what that darkness is that you might see on the back of the leaves. And essentially, <laughs> and this has been the problem that I've had with this plant since day one, it is edema, so plant edema. And a lot of people, this can appear in different forms on different plants. I know, for instance, when I get it on my Gloriosum, it can sometimes look like a bubble filled with liquid. And it almost does look a bit like a spot or a cyst. And in essence, it is very similar to that. What edema is, what plant edema is, is an inconsistency with water. And <laughs> I have fun trying to research that one because I've... You start going down a rabbit hole, I did this, and you're no wiser by the end of it than you were when you first started. <laughs> but... Um, Essentially, it's inconsistency with the water, and what happens is the plant draws up the water too, too quickly, and then the cells on the leaves will burst. Now, I will say, even though you're seeing some edema at the back of these leaves, they're not appearing in the front of the leaves. And the problem that I was having with this plant and edema, as I said, from day one, it doesn't matter if it was in the original soil that it came in, in light airy arrowed soil mix that I had it in. Most of these soil mixes were good, by the way. It wasn't what was necessarily causing this. It was to do with the watering, and more so than any other plant, this one. Interestingly enough, never had that problem with a silver one. Have always had this problem with this one. I don't know if I got one that was sensitive from day one, and whether or not if I had got a different green dragon scale, I wouldn't have had this problem, because I don't see this being an issue for a lot of people. Again, I will say this, if you've had this experience, do let me know down below, and what you will then start getting if it does get quite dire, and this is what I used to get all the time before I moved it into pond, was the entire leaf would start deteriorating into mush and dying back very, very quickly. But, and you can see there, there's only a tiny bit of edema on the side there, I was never able to find a solution for this because edema, at least from what I can find online, there is no treatment, if that makes sense. So when you get edema in the plant or the leaf, you've got edema in the plant or the leaf. The problem that you then also get is that it can start kind of flaking off and mushing off the plant, and that's an open wound potentially, so it could also harbour some bacteria and things like that, so bear that in mind. But I will always come back to the same thing when I say this. In nature, I would imagine this is a plant that very rarely looks as pristine as we would get it in the shops. As with most things in nature, they will get battered by the elements, by pests, by, anim by animals. So this might be one that needs very, very specific conditions. I have not been able to figure this one out. As I said, with the silver one, I keep leaning down to pick it up. With the silver one, it's less of an issue. You can see there's a tiny bit there, but that is possibly its oldest leaf. Everything else, and I'll show you the backs of these leaves, there is no edema. Whilst with this one, a lot of these leaves have got edema. So again, don't know if this is just a bit of a bum alocasia green dragon scale, but that's the big one that I would say here about care, is just being aware of things like edema, give it a light arid soil mix, it will do quite well, it's an alocasia, it's done well in a net pot, it's done well in a terracotta pot, it's done okay in pond. So I think that's what I wanted to say about accessories or care, let's move on to final thoughts. So I put the plants down because holding them for quite a long time, getting a bit tiring. Um, and let's just wrap up with this one. So 
I'll start off with my usual question that I always do at the beginning of this topic, and I will say, knowing what I know now, if I didn't have this plant, would I purchase this plant? Yes, I still enjoy this plant. By far, not just in terms of alocasia, but for me, one of the most unique leaves that I have in my collection. And it is kind of, at least in my experience has been, when people can anthropomorphize, and that is in essence kind of putting human features onto something, they can kind of relate to it a bit better. I know a dragon scale is not a human feature, but it is something that we are kind of aware of from mythology, from all these things, and it does harken those things. It's like mythical beast, it's a dragon, but it really does look like a dragon scale, the same way that the Alocasia cupria, for me at least, looks a bit like, um, oh, I'm trying to remember, no, not an isopod, but those um, fossils that you tend to get that kind of look a bit scarab-esque, but they were in the sea. I am not describing this well. Is it a nautilus shell? I might be wrong, but it might be that. I will see if I can find it and put it up here. But all of these things that have got very recognizable shapes to us, I think you would have an affinity towards it because it's just like, oh, it looks really cool because it looks like that. It's something that isn't that, but looks like that. So yeah, hopefully I've described that well. I don't know if I have, but um, yeah, so I would definitely get it again. If I was to give it a score from zero being the worst and 10 being the best, this is an interesting one and I'll score the silver one separate from the green one. The silver one, and I'm kicking myself for not getting a bigger plant, but I wanted to try it and see if it was different from the green one, I would probably give it a score of seven. I really do like it. I liked it more than I liked the green one, which is surprising because color-wise I would still prefer the green one. I think the reason why I'm preferring the silver one is because it hasn't given me as many issues as the green one. Does that make sense? Uh, the green one I would probably score close to five or a six, possibly even a four, less so in terms of enjoying having the plant in my space and all these things, but the sheer level of issues I've had with edema and how much it has decreased to this size from this size. And that's after years of trying to get it to work well. So it does have a special place in my heart now because it still hasn't died on me. For, for all of my efforts, basically. I wasn't trying to kill it, but it, you, you would think I was trying to kill it the whole time. But yeah, so I would give it a lower score for that reason. But yeah, very, very curious with this one as to what your experience is. If you've got this, what are your experiences? What have they been with this plant? Has it given you as much grief as it's given me? Please do let me know down below. As always, Hopefully you've enjoyed, hopefully I shall see you here soon, and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, bye.